everybody and welcome to this webinar. I'm Sumera Abdi and uh, with me today I have two experts, Santosh Joseph, founder and CEO of Germinate Investor Services and Radhika Gupta, who's the MD and CEO of Edelweiss AMC. And the reason I've asked them to join me today is because we want to talk a little bit about balanced advantage funds. But before we do that, I want to just lay the context a little bit. So I know a lot of you watching this may probably already know this, but for those who don't you know, there are five kinds of mutual funds, okay? So there's equity, there's debt, there's hybrid, there's solution-oriented, and then there's others, right? So solution-oriented are all these retirement plans, children's plans, others are ETFs, fund of funds, etc. And equity and debt, of course, is commonly known. Now hybrid is the category we'll be focusing on. Within hybrid, there are six varieties of hybrid, right? So there's the conservative hybrid, there is the balanced hybrid, the aggressive hybrid, there's the dynamic asset allocation or balanced advantage. This is where we're focusing on. And then there's the multi-asset allocation, there's arbitrage, and there is equity saving. So these are the kinds of hybrid funds which are there. Out of this, we are choosing today to focus on the balanced advantage fund. So Radhika, first to you, I mean, you know, there are so many different funds. And then within hybrid, there are so many categories, right? Um, what sets balanced advantage apart from the rest of the hybrid pack? And, you know, why does it make sense for an investor? So I think the balanced advantage category, which has always been my favorite category, solves a very basic investor need and a very basic investment problem. I think the investor need when I look at most of us as investors that we want is we want moderate returns. But we do want downside protection because the fact is markets are volatile. We are sitting in on the back of 2020 and talking about this. But you have periods like March where markets fall 30% and many of us are not comfortable with our portfolio falling 20-30% and you have periods of rally. So I think the balanced advantage fund achieves that blend of meaningful upside protection and downside protection. The second question that you asked is how is this different and what does this do differently from the rest of the hybrid category? I think what distinguishes balanced advantage funds is they hold a combination of equity and debt, but that ratio keeps changing. So that ratio could be 30% equity, 70% debt or 80% equity, 20% debt on average 50-60% and it changes basis market conditions. And what's really important here and I'm sure we'll talk about this is that the change is based on automated factors it is very very hard to time markets i mean all of us have seen that emotions play a big role balanced advantage funds in some sense automate that process of moving in and out of markets so that you can get the most out of them without losing a lot we'll come back to that in a little bit but first let me just get some thoughts in from santosh uh, you know santosh today is the day that the sensex has hit uh, 50000 um you know, I mean, is this an environment in which you're recommending balanced advantage funds? I mean, which is the right environment or is it something uh, that's meant for all seasons? Yeah, I think when people who are watching the news see uh, those congratulatory notes of census hitting 50,000, the first thought crossing into an investor's mind. Now, if he's invested already, he'd be wondering, hey, is this the time to take out my money? Because when you look at it from the lows of March 2020, it's almost about 90, 100% higher. And for an investor who's looking to invest in equity, he's wondering, is it an all-time high? How is the best way I can uh, enter into it? And is this uh, a perilous times to enter? So therefore, when you look at these two predicaments by one, an investor who's already invested and an investor who's looking to invest, uh, you know, balanced advantage funds possibly is a great solution. Uh, reason is that you have a great combination of fixed income and equity uh, managed and packaged well to take care of the benefits of either uh, all time high or even for a guy who's entering today that the all time high will really matter significantly lesser than directly entering into equities uh, through a direct diversified fund route. So I think it's a win win for both. And this is where uh, you get a beautiful crossover between choosing uh, and timing the market by remaining to stay invested or entering at uh, the times like where markets are at all time high. Radhika, I just wanted to ask you an industry question. I mean, I'm sure, uh, you know, you would have spoken with most of your peers. Uh, you know, BAF is, uh, I mean, you know, when an investor uh, uh, hears about it, they hear that it's more automated, right? Now, how exactly does this uh, automation work? I mean, you know, how much is the contribution of the fund manager and how much is the contribution 
of the process? Sure. So I think there are three parts to any BAF. If I was judging the BAF, there is an equity component because you're holding whatever 50, 60, 70 percent equities that can be automated or not. It's just picking stocks, right? So however the fund picks stocks, then there is fixed income. That's however the fund manages fixed income. And the third, which is the most important part of the BAF, is the shift between how much equity and fixed income. So am I 80, 20? Am I 30, 70? Whatever I am. I think you look at most, if not all of the industry, that process is highly automated. In fact, I would go so far as to say in most peers, there is no level of fund manager discretion, which I think is a very, very powerful thing because globally also people don't time markets well, including fund managers. You want to let it be a process. However, how that uh, modeling happens or what factors people use to do that because ultimately any automated process uses some input. So I can automate the process by saying I look at price to earnings levels and then decide how much equity I'll hold. Or I can say I look at last 50 day market performance, which is another way to do it. So there are different ways by which you can make that change to equity levels. Everybody automates it. They use a different model in the background. Okay. Uh, Santosh, uh, since you would have studied most of these uh, schemes, is there one model which is better than the other? I mean, if there's an investor who's watching this right now and, you know, I mean, should they be looking out for this, which is the kind of model a fund is following, you know, to sort of shift their allocation between equity and debt and therefore is one more effective than the other? Well, that's a, a, a actually a tough call. When you actually have selected, uh, you know, BAF as your uh, you know, a allocation for funds, you'd realize, uh, like Radhika said, each of them have their own uh, models that they have in place. Now, you'll notice that if the model is built aggressively, you'll do very well in uh, a rising market scenario. And if the model is a little conservative, uh, you'll fall less. Uh, I think trying to choose only because of a model is going to be a little counterintuitive here because what's going to happen is that uh, you will again see a small cycle playing out within the BAF category. So what is better is that you take the BAF, diversify within the allocation of your money in BAF to maybe one or two BAFs which have distinct models that play. Now, some people follow a price to earning, some people follow a triangulation between price to earning, price to book and even some level of momentum uh, that the market is playing out. Some people take the very conservative approach of a fixed income plus kind of a return orientation. Some people look at equity or equity kind of return orientation. So what is ideal for you is just take a combination of maybe uh, one or two by diversifying within the BAFs so that you get the best of the entire BAF and the models that are available in the market follow up to that therefore uh, you know i mean since it's automated and you know I, I get all the advantages right but is there any evidence to suggest that baf has given uh, you know better risk adjusted returns than an investor who might want to invest separately in equity and debt i mean why will i not take uh, the specialization of you know two fund managers separately as opposed to combine it together in a bag. So I think, Sumaira, you can do that. I think there are two, three parts to it. You can do equity and debt separately. One is that, as you know, we've been saying on the short timing is very, very difficult. So even in March, if you were doing equity and debt and you had to shift the allocations yourself, would you have the courage to go into equities in March or April? Probably not. I mean, I know a lot of investors at the time the Biden election happened, they wanted to jump into equities, but they just could not, right? Um, because of all the noise around them. So one, I think it's easier said than done yourselves. Secondly, BAFs are more tax efficient to do the shift. If you try to do the shift yourself and BAFs are very, very dynamic when they do the shift, you will be paying taxes because of the mutual fund tax structure. It becomes a lot more uh, advantageous. So I think there are cases for letting this happen in a more professional way uh, than trying to do it yourself. Okay, um, uh, Santosh, uh uh, a follow-up to you then one of course is this that uh, you know what do you recommend to clients uh, you know go for a BAF or go for equity and debt separately and the other thing that I want to ask is that you know in terms of the selection of a BAF right I mean this is a category that has become very popular now what are the key factors should they be looking at uh, the fund managers you know like you said that the process just by itself uh, you know is not the differentiator what should they then look for I mean how is one fund better than the other? Is it the past returns? Is there evidence to suggest that past returns, you know, can be, uh, I mean, it will be consistent going forward as well. What do they look for? Um, maybe you can uh, 
look at a, maybe a little more granular uh, angle to this that past returns are maybe a nice way to highlight how a baf has worked now we should also understand that when someone comes into baf he wants to get into equity but he wants a hedge around equity in terms of downside protection and upside participation so when you actually show returns i think rather than just show uh, the performance what you i think can highlight is the performance of the fund which shows the upside and downside capture now when you take let's say two or three funds that are there and i think you should use a little longer time and maybe use a com combination of cagr and calendar returns to show let's take for the month of march let's take jan to march as one period and then april to uh, jan right now as another period you can easily show a uh, difference between how a model has worked effectively in one a scenario where the market just collapsed 30% in a really short time maybe about 20 30 days two in the next uh, nine months you had market going higher month on month so did the model uh, work dynamically by on one side protecting your downside up to march 31st and after that did they regularly keep increasing equity allocation because they felt favorable market conditions show that as a case in point within that figure out which are the funds that captured both uh, the downside protection and the upside and figure out the the fund size and the model and understand that the risk that the client is looking for does it match along with the model itself and then you take a call so it's just not just the returns for example you have three funds and one is about 2 3% higher or 2 3% lower that's just a beginning point but then you have to look at both the upside and downside capture and the size of the fund uh, and you know again some people uh, like to go with the fund which is at least got a five year plus uh, track record and uh, some people don't mind looking at a new fund if it's going to be a baf baf category because they like a fund house and the process that the fund the fund house is followed for other uh, investments to consider Mr. Sanjay Deshpande has reminded us of a question which I had promised to ask, but I didn't. So he wants to know how exactly is this balancing done uh, between equity and debt? Because naturally, when equity is high, uh, debt is low. Uh, Radhika, Santosh, who would like to take it? Yeah, I'll take that. I think there are multiple approaches, and Sanjay, that's a great question uh, in terms of how rebalancing is done. So I think there are. primarily two different approaches without generalizing too much one approach typically as santosh says typically follows price to earnings kind of model so in this kind of approach you know typically when equity markets have run up like they have right now price to earnings ratios will be higher so the baf will hold a little less equity and more fixed income uh this is a common approach that is followed there is a second more momentum based approach which says that when equity markets are doing well when the weather is kind of healthy i will hold higher equity allocation and lower fixed income allocation when markets are lower and they're volatile etc etc then i will hold lower equity allocation so there's no one answer to this question these are broadly the two approaches that are followed in the market uh, i think santosh made a point earlier in this webinar that that is why there is because there are different approaches you know you could pick a baf that has one of these two approaches and have multiple bafs in the same portfolio and have two complementary products you know we spoke about whether bafs uh, are good for uh, new investors or seasoned investors uh we didn't talk about whether it's good for young investors now i'm guessing new investors can even be people you know who are older so therefore uh we have a question from sukesh shetty saying that you know would it be suitable for young investors considering that you know they have an opportunity to go for a mid cap or a small cap fund you know given their long time horizon and therefore how does baf stack up so so case the the very interesting part uh, is that especially when you call yourself young or starting of new which means you have a longer time horizon you may think that uh, you know you're more suited to take a slightly higher risky product like mid cap and small cap it is right but there's a there's a just just a regular challenge that is that when you start today in a mid cap or a small cap fund you know that there are cycles that are going to play out in the markets in general and within that the mid cap and small cap we have very recent memory that serves us saying that 2018 and 19 
and maybe even uh, a large part of 20 was a really rough year as far as mid cap and small cap investing was concerned now at that particular point of time are you going to drop the travel uh, travel or face the exhaustion of staying invested because you're the winner is the last man standing when you're an investor now Therefore, if you were to keep the end in sight and say you want to stay invested for a long haul and you want to make a, a superior return, you have to avoid anything that takes away your attention from staying invested. And therefore, you could also consider BAFs for a long term investing because it makes investing easy, simpler, avoids exhaustion or the lack of inspiration, motivation to add more money or to continue to stay invested. So while I'm saying that uh, mid cap and small caps are great for young and long term investors, it's not that BAPs are against you, even they can go well for you, but for two different reasons. And Radhika, just to wrap up the show, you know, when we, uh, you know, track, say, auto sales, right, when we track uh, sales of uh, new houses. The one key monitorable that people talk about, or at least the companies talk about, and they say, you know, inquiries are increasing, or that, you know, inquiries are not increasing. So, you know, I, and you're very active in terms of your engagement uh, with investors. So, what would you say about balanced advantage? I mean, are inquiries increasing? I mean, for me, that is the real test, right? Not that a distributor has come or an yeah. advisor has come to convince me to invest in this. Is it that am I actively seeking uh, to know about something that I should be using for my investment? So what has been your experience? So I'll just give you a couple of data points on inquiries are increasing. I think if you look at the Amphi publishes data on various industry categories and the sales that are happening, um, and I think BAF is one of the categories that is getting the highest gross sales today. So I think that is a metric that at least people are interested in the category. I think if you look at the number of investors that most AMCs are seeing, even touching our websites, uh, forget actually investing, but touching our websites and our BAF product pages, etc., I think that is increasing. Um, and I think the number of investors coming into the category is also increasing. The folio count in the category is increasing. So I think these are all very, very encouraging trends. I mean, among domestic uh, equity funds, this is a category we answer a lot of questions about. And I think a lot of AMCs, to give everyone credit, are building awareness about BAF as a category. I mean, three, four folks have done major, you know, sort of awareness campaigns. A lot of people are trying to build out awareness of the dynamic asset allocation or BAF category. So I think in many ways, yes, inquiries are increasing. Santosh, what has been your experience? Are you having to talk to clients about balanced advantage funds or are they coming and asking you about it? It's both. In fact, it's, what is interesting is when we want to tell people uh, that they could invest more money and then they, the common apprehension is market being at an all-time high or the whole of last year that markets are so volatile. You are wanting to give them the confidence saying that we can have a better handle in terms of managing market and your emotion so if one were to say how do i better manage the market or the investor's emotion then i think the natural uh, you know veering is towards a, a BAF product now uh, for the people who are uh, you know whom we are going out for this is the answer now the people who are coming in they don't necessarily say give me BAF, but what they're saying is can give me a product that can help me manage volatility can, can help me get better return than fixed income they can also tell me that you know markets uh, you know going one side or the other side will not affect me too much so you you see unlike you and me they will not use the word BAF, but they're definitely going to you know pose that question uh, in various forms and means which we have to pick up saying that we know what they want when someone says i want to be in equity but i don't want the equity risk i want uh, in that proportion i want to be in fixed income but you know it's only for that uh, momentary play where i can move in more into equity or get that liquidity sort of uh, bit managed and they say i want to do this but i can't i don't have the time i don't have the bandwidth or or even I don't want to be regularly switching in. So we pick up those hints and know that clearly we see huge, uh, you know, momentum and inquiries for uh, these uh, dynamic products, which are now very easily demarketed as BAF. Yeah, you know, when you say uh, I want something healthy, but you don't want to spell out soup, <laughs> you're hoping that That's right. a healthy sandwich. Okay. Guys, uh, Radhika, Santosh, thank you very much for your time this evening and for your very balanced views. Uh, <laughs> and everyone who's watching, I hope you enjoy yourself and I hope uh, you've, you know, gone, you go back with some takeaways 
And if there are any further questions or queries or, you know, any clarity that you see, do find us, all three of us on Twitter. So do reach out to us. But thanks very much for watching. And once again, Radhika and Santosh, thanks a lot uh, for making it simpler. Bye-bye. Innovate. Enable.